Hello, and a very warm welcome to the Studio Canal Presents podcast. My name is Simon Brew from Film Stories magazine, and this is a regular podcast celebrating one of the biggest and deepest film libraries in the world. Studio Canal's extensive catalogue of films brings together cinema from around the globe, going back over a century. The full library is over 6,000 titles strong, including animated favourites The Breadwinner and Song of the Sea, movie night gems such as Highlander and The Producers, and acclaimed modern masterpieces Carol and Pan's Labyrinth. And we're going to do our very best to explore it all in this podcast. In this episode, we're focusing on a flat-out science fiction classic, Nicholas Rogue's 1976 feature The Man Who Fell to Earth. Still as impactful as it always was, the film features David Bowie in arguably his finest screen role. One man who's a huge fan of the film and of David Bowie? Well, that would be arguably the nation's favourite film critic, Mark Kermode. And he's going to be joining me to talk about the film after this clip. This is some kind of space vehicle, right? What for? The solar probe? I want you to think beyond that. I want to show you this because I value your contribution to my work. Well, I'm not certain what that's to be. Fuel conservation, Dr. Bryce. Maybe the key to our project. Ask me. What? The question you've been wanting to ask ever since we met. Are you Lithuanian? I come from England. Oh, that's not so terrible. So a very big hello and welcome to the Studio Canal Presents podcast to Mark Kermode. Hello, Mark Kermode. Hey, Simon. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you very much. Mark, have you got a film fact about yourself? We try and start our conversations with guests talking about film facts. You're in a room surrounded by film memorabilia. When you say a film fact, I mean, yeah. which one do you want? What, I mean, I'll have number 732, please. Okay, that'll be this. Hang on. Okay. This, which you can see because we're on Zoom. Okay. This is a uh, thing which I have hanging on my my wall, and it is a a glass case, and there's a note, and it says, to Mark, with thanks and love, actually, M and Richard, and it is a clip of the 35mm still of a print of love, actually, of Hugh Grant's Dancing Prime Minister. It's one of my proudest possessions. There you go. I, I, I can't match that. I think I chose well. I think I chose well. Um, Mark, thank you for joining us. We're here to talk about a film I know that's very close to your heart, and it's one that I've experienced for the first time fairly recently. We're talking about The Man Who Fell to Earth. So can you set the scene for us? When and where did you first see it? I was a huge Bowie fan, you know, from a fairly young age. There's a picture of me in Port Erin in the Isle of Man when I was 12 or something, dressed as, you know, what I considered to be dressed as Bowie. (laughs) You know, with a zigzag on my face and, you know, wearing my my mother's clothes and my sister's clothes. And when Man Who Fell to Earth came out in the mid-70s, it was an X-rated film. Now, yeah. back then, in the, in the dim and distant past, the film being X-rated meant in the UK that you couldn't see it unless you were 18 years old. I was 13 when it came out. So I saw all these posters for it and I loved the idea of it and I bought the novel by Walter Tevis... Then it was a couple of years later that I finally saw the film. I must have been, I suppose, 15 or 16 by that point. And I saw it at a rep cinema near near where I used to live in East Finchley called the the Phoenix in East Finchley. So in the meantime, in the interim, I had read the novel and I had also bought the albums that have images of Bowie on the front cover that are taken from The Man Who Fell to Earth. So the front cover of Station to Station, which is a black and white picture of Bowie. If you don't know what it is, it's kind of confusing, but it's Bowie with his hair slicked back, looking into what looks like an enclosed space with this weird, it looks like sound baffling inside it. And it's actually a still of him looking into a kind of a makeshift craft. And then the front cover of Low, which of course is, you know, the great Bowie album from which Sound and Vision comes, is a picture of him, like an orange hewn picture of him wearing a duffel coat, which is from very, very early on in The Man Who Fell to Earth. So not unlike The Exorcist, by the time I saw the film, I'd listened to the albums that were connected to it. I'd read the book that was connected to it. I had a copy of the poster. The film, actually seeing the film was a kind of afterthought. And it it delighted me. I, I just loved it. 
and I I've watched it many times since. In fact, I you know I've watched it fairly recently, not just in preparation for this podcast, but I just happened to have a, an evening free and I watched it again because I just think it's endlessly fascinating. There's loads of things wrong with it. There's loads of things that are kind of cronky and shonky about it. I don't care about any of them. Somebody bought me a book recently about the making of The Man Who Fell to Earth. It was a book was all over the place, just completely <laughs> poorly written, but I didn't care. It's just one of those films that I love. I mean, it's interesting. You said there that it was an X certificate when it came out. One of yeah. the things I noticed picking it up now is it's still an 18 certificate now. We're in an era where a lot of film certificates are diluted over time. But the themes of this and the way that the unrelenting way it addresses those themes are still just as stark to audiences. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that nowadays the certification issues are to do with not just the the nudity or anything, but also to do with the themes of sex and violence. I mean, essentially, the thing that's fascinating about the film is that, as I said, it's based on this novel by Walter Tevis, which if you read the novel is pretty close to the film. Yeah. I mean, since then, there's been a TV series adaptation, which I haven't seen. But Walter Tevis is now probably best known for writing The Queen's Gambit, which, of course, is this huge success. And The Queen's Gambit appears to be about chess, but it isn't really about chess. I mean, it's partly about chess, but it's also about addiction, which is a key theme in Tevis's novels and indeed in Tevis's life. Yeah. You know, he himself struggled with addiction and an awful lot of what happens in Queen's Gambit, which anyone who, who knows the series will know that very, very early on, in tandem with her development of this kind of almost preternatural chess ability, she's taking medication that she's given in this orphanage that she's in and she's being prescribed these drugs that she is then using or not prescribed she's just being handed out these drugs which, which actually did used to happen and then when the drugs are taken away from her she worries that she will no longer have the ability to envisage the chessboard in the way that she does there are the scenes in the in the tv show in which she's lying on her bed and she looks up into the ceiling and you see the chess parts moving around but really what that series is primarily about is about her struggle with addiction and the way in which she believes that her abilities are coming from things other than herself. Yeah. The Man Who Fell to Earth is similarly primarily about addiction. I mean, the, the kind of the shaggy dog story version of The Man Who Fell to Earth is it's a story about a man who travels across the galaxy in search of a drink and winds up drunk. <laughs> Because the character is somebody who comes from another planet where the planet has dried up and they've looked across the universe and they've seen the Earth, which is the blue planet. And they've realized that actually it has the thing that they need most, which is water. And so he gets sent as a kind of, you know, as an outrider yeah. and he lands on Earth. And in the film, and I said this, the film is unusually close to the book. As with all Nick Rogues, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the film that isn't in the book. But the themes, the central themes are the same. And he gets to Earth, and then when he gets to Earth, he becomes intoxicated, both literally and metaphorically. He, you know, yeah. the first thing that you see in the film is that he drinks water. You know, he takes a gulp of water, and then very soon he starts drinking alcohol. And then the next thing, he's drinking cocktails and he's consuming alcohol. I don't want to spoil the plot of the film for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it, what happens at the beginning sets in motion an inevitable chain of events yeah. that will only go one way. So. Queen's Gambit is about chess, but it's about addiction. The Man Who Fell to Earth is about space aliens, but it's about addiction. It's like a scotch and water or something, Mr. Newton. Oh, a glass of water. You said also at the start that you came to this as a Bowie fan first before you got to the novel. Yeah. How closely were you following Bowie's screen roles? Because this wasn't his first film role, was it? Well, no, I mean, Bowie's very first screen role, I mean, you know, Bowie's first feature film screen role is, we talked about this in Secrets of Cinema, it is literally a walk-on, dragged-off role. He's behind the bar in Virgin Soldiers, and his character goes from, if I remember rightly, right of frame to left of frame, and then back from left to right, and we sort of, we made a joke about it, about slowing it down, because it's, you know, it's... <laughs> It's a real, you know, walk on. It counts. It, it gets you an IMDb credit. It does. It's it gets the you an... currency. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was talking recently to somebody else. I was interviewing somebody else who, who had remembered being in a. Oh, I know who it was. It was Brian Cox. Brian Cox. Yeah. Because he'd written his autobiography, and he remembers in his autobiography doing a crime television show, in which he said, "Oh, and there was this young actor." who turned out later on to be David Bowie as opposed to, to David Jones. So there's kind of flutterings at the beginning and then there's the mime stuff that he did with Lindsay Kemp and there's the art house experimental stuff. But you can say safely that it's Bowie's first 
proper, fully fledged. I mean, obviously he'd done the videos and there is an argument that what he was doing in some of those early pop videos, like the video for Life on Mars, which is used quite heavily in um, Moon Age Daydream, yeah. or the video for Space Oddity, which again, is like a little drama in which he's playing the, the lead roles. But it is really the first fully fledged film role. And of course, the reason that he's cast in it is because Nick Rogue actually made a habit. Nick Rogue, who directed Man Who Fell to Earth, yeah. co-directed performance with uh, Don Camel. Yeah. And then during the course of his film career, he found himself on a number of occasions working with people that you would think of primarily as pop stars. So, you know, Art Garfunkel, David Bowie, Mick Jagger. I interviewed Rogue quite a few times. I was a big fan of his work. And he always said, you know, anybody who thought that it was weird to cast pop stars in acting roles, he said, what do you think pop stars are doing? Yeah. He said, they're acting. That's what they're doing. Every time they're in public, they're acting. They're acting a persona. And famously, what happened in the case of Man Who Fell to Earth is that Peter O'Toole was briefly in the frame, as was... Um, Michael Crichton was in there. The author of Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton. Yeah. Michael Crichton famously was in the frame because he was tall. In the Walter Tevis novel, one of the things that defines the man who fell to earth is that he's tall and spindly and, and the pressure of Earth's atmosphere is kind of slightly too much for him. Yeah. He looks like he might break under the pressure of, of being on Earth. Well, that was a role that people thought that physically Michael Crichton could fulfill. And then Peter O'Toole was thought of. But what happened was that Nick Rogue saw the Alan Yentob documentary, Cracked Actor, yeah. which again features in Moon Age Daydream. And it's interesting, if you watch Moon Age Daydream, which is the brilliant, um, I think brilliant, documentary about, it's kind of a montage rather than documentary about David Bowie. What the director does there is that he intercuts scenes from Cracked Actor with scenes from The Man Who Fell to Earth. And it's actually quite hard to see where the join is. <laughs> because in Cracked Actor, the documentary by Alan Yentob, Bowie is pictured being driven around America in a black limousine, looking out at the world around him as if he's an alien looking out at this insane world around him. There's one moment when they're driving through the desert. Bowie is drinking a carton of milk. This is a moment that appears in, um, in Moon Age Daydream. Bowie's drinking a carton of milk and he's asked, you know, what's it like being here in America? And he says, there's a fly in my milk. There's an alien <laughs> body in my milk. You think he's just talking off. Then he says, and it's swimming around in this milk and it's getting all this milk and it's absorbing all this milk. And you realize that what he's talking about is he's talking about his experience of being in, in America, that he's swimming around in all this milk, but he's also kind of drowning. Yeah. And then it cuts rather beautifully to him looking out of the window and they're in the middle of the desert. He says, look, it's a wax museum. There's a wax museum in the middle of the desert. You'd think it would melt. <laughs> so he's got the appearance of somebody in that documentary who is an alien looking through a glass window at this mad world outside him and is on the one hand infatuated by gulping it all down, by literally drowning in the milk of it, but also being, you know, saying, why doesn't the wax museum melt? And Nick Rogue went, that's the guy. That is the man who fell to earth. Let's just get him. And the argument about Bowie's acting in Man Who Fell to Earth was always that he wasn't acting, yeah. that he was being Bowie. Now, I think that's completely, you know, not true because the fact is Bowie was an act. Yeah. You know, anyone who, who knows anything about Bowie knows that all those different persona and things that he created, they were all an act on some level. They, There's a very interesting interview, again, it features in Moon Age Daydream, in which he sort of asked... You know, when, when he stripped everything away, this is post-Berlin and everything, he said, you know, is this the real you? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not sure who I am when you take away all, all the trappings. Anyway, that's how Rogue cast Bowie. Rogue saw him in that documentary and went, he is literally the man who fell to earth. And then Bowie said famously when he was interviewed on, because I used to listen to Bowie interviews on the, if he was ever interviewed on the yeah. radio, I'd listen to him and I'd, you know, get all the, clippings and that sort of thing and he was asked did you inhabit the role of the man who fell to earth you know or did you just shed he said no i walked around as that person for the best part of two years yeah so it, it, he saw the connection as well so it's a perfect bit of casting if you take this assignment you'll have complete authority below me i don't want to have contact with anyone except you when you take this position mr farnsworth you'll be able to replace your antiquated sound equipment and Buy some of mine. Buy it? And it costs naturally. 
Perhaps you're not so different after all, Mr. Newton. Nicholas Rogue talked about the casting of Bowie in his memoir, which I've been reading, his memoir, The World is Ever Changing. And there's a lovely story where he concludes he didn't know if Bowie cast him or he cast Bowie in the end. Yeah. And again, I'm sure you know this, but Bowie was three hours late for this meeting. And if I can just quote you what he said in the book, Go ahead. it just said, Bowie came up and said, I really want to do it, turning up three hours late. Is that what you wanted to hear? Yes. Okay, get in touch. When do you need me? Well, can my people get onto your people tomorrow? Yes. Okay, I want to bring some people with me. Will your people arrange that? Yes. Terrific. Right, see you then. And we're in an era where we see movie star contracts occasionally just appear on social media as like great big huge tomes and prolonged negotiations. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like the casting was just distilled down in the end to like almost like a one minute chat. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as I understand, the most problematic issue, well, the two most problematic issues were always going to be whether or not they could find time in Bowie's schedule that would make it work. And secondly, dealing with the fact that Bowie was very heavily into cocaine at that point. And that obviously, therefore, you had to know that going in. Yeah. You know, that he was functioning with a very high intake of cocaine, but it was a part of his life. And Rogue has talked very clearly about the fact that they knew that it was all OK. It was all fine because he was completely functional. Yeah. I mean, Bowie himself talks later on, looking back on his life and his sort of various uh, times with cocaine. There was a thing that he said in, um, in one interview. He said, uh, Station to Station was recorded in such and such a studio. I know this because I have read it in a book, <laughs> meaning I have got absolutely no memory of it happening. So he, it was quite a paranoid time for him. I mean, very creative. If you look at the front cover of David Live, you know, which is kind of around the same period just before. Yeah. Again, Bowie later on looked back at the cover of that album and said that album shouldn't be called David Live. It should be called Bowie Is Alive because he looks you know, he looks like a corpse. I mean, he literally looks like a walking corpse. He's skeletal. But oddly enough, that kind of works quite well for the role, the sort of fragility and the paranoia and the slight sense of kind of, um, you know, being separated from the normal course of events. But beyond that, him and Rogue just seem to have just agreed that it was right. Yeah. And there wasn't much discussion beyond that. They both knew that it was the right bit of casting. And then, then it was it was simply just technicals after that. And Bowie gave Nick Rogue a lot of credit for casting him as well. Yeah. I, I mean, he talked about just what a bold move that was from Rogue to do that in the first place. Yeah, I mean, Rogue's career is so fascinating because if you talk to somebody like Ben Wheatley, you know, he has this kind of mantra, which is that there are two coterminous lines of British filmmaking. One of them is the kitchen sink realism line that kind of comes through you know, what we would think of latterly as, as Ken Loach. And the other is this kind of fantastical line that goes from Powell and Pressburger through Ken Russell, through Nick Rogue, into, you know, I presume, I mean, you could say maybe Lynn Ramsey or, but, you yeah. know, but the more kind of poetic adventurous. And what Ben Wheatley always talked about was trying to divine the best thing of those two separate strands. What Rogue was doing was very much in the Powell and Pressburger trend of making movies that had a very, very surreal edge, particularly in relation to time. And this is a very musical thing, and it's partly to do with Rogue's editing and, and the way in which his films literally shift time around them. So if you look at Don't Look Now, yeah. which, of course, is one of the greatest movies ever made, and famously was released by British Lion with The Wicker Man as the supporting feature. So, I mean, you know, you, you saw The Wicker Man first and then you watched Don't Look Now, which I still <laughs> think audiences in 1970 didn't know what had hit them. I mean, you literally, you have, you have, you know, oh God, oh Jesus Christ, the film ends and then you start Don't Look Now. And 1970s, the pub was shut afterwards as well, wasn't it? What chance did you have? Yeah, just astonishing. Again, so Don't Look Now is based on a Daphne du Maurier story, and it, mm. there are very different things in the film that are in the script. The key difference between the film and the book, but it's not a book, it's a novella, but it's a short story, but, you know, it's a short novel. Yeah. In the original Daphne du Maurier source, their daughter has died before the story starts. Christine does not drown. She dies of an illness. So the whole thing in Don't Look Now of the daughter going into the water and then them going on holiday to Venice and the daughter coming out of the water wearing the red coat yep. over and over again. That, that whole going into the water, going out of the water, that reflective surfaces, that's all to do with the film. And what the film does in its opening segment, and somewhere 
There's an interview which I did with Rogue, which was literally about the opening 10 minutes of Don't Look Now. I think it was for the Culture Show. And he talks about the fact that in the opening 10 minutes, the whole of the film is set up, the whole story of the film is set up. There's the question about, you know, why is it water on the earth and curvature and all that? And he literally says, not everything is what it seems or something on those lines. And Rogue says, look, he literally says the meaning of the movie. Aha. Lake Ontario curves more than three degrees from its easternmost shore to its westernmost shore. So, frozen water isn't flat. The thing is what it seems. But the whole gag of Don't Look Now is yeah. that there is a somebody in that film who is psychic who does not believe in psychics. And there is somebody in that film who is not psychic who does believe in psychics. So the reason Don't Look Now works, and this is very Daphne du Maurier, that it is a shaggy dog story. The husband, played in the film by Donald Sutherland, does not believe that it's possible to see other worlds. Yeah. And he does literally see another world, but doesn't know he's done it. Meanwhile, Christine, the daughter, is apparently appearing in visions to psychics who you don't know whether or not to trust. And his wife, who does not see Christine and is therefore obsessed with the fact that she cannot see Christine, that she has lost something she cannot see, absolutely believes in psychics. And at the end of the novella of Don't Look Now, as, pardon me if this is a plot spoiler, as one of the key characters is dying, that key character thinks, what a bloody silly way to die. It's like a dark <laughs> joke. It's like a dark, shaggy dog story. Yeah. The same can be said of The Man Who Fell to Earth. It's a film that the whole thing is set up in the beginning. He falls to earth, Icarus descending, all that stuff. He drinks. And then that's what happens. What happens is he drinks. And then he becomes seduced by the world and he becomes seduced by his relationship with an earthbound woman who is in fact, you know, a kind of mirror image of the relationship that he has with the lost family on, on the other planet. And, you know, that's why the whole thing about, you know, same actress. Yeah. But the progress of it is, as I said before, he comes in search of a drink, he winds up a drunk. I just want it to be like it was. Me. The two of us. You. You. The way you were. That's the way I am. We talked about Bowie's performance and just the sheer impact of that role. But I do wonder, even if you didn't know Bowie and you just saw him stride on screen for the first time in that role, if it would have had the same impact. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Bowie and his trousers in Labyrinth. But <laughs> I, I just think in terms of his acting performances and sheer screen presence, now, does this top the lot for you? Well, I think it does in many ways because it's such a perfect piece of casting. Michael Crichton wouldn't have smashed this, I don't think. <laughs> no, but firstly, Bowie doesn't stride into that performance. He actually does the opposite of that. I mean, I think one of the first shots you see is of him coming down the slag heap, you know, and he's struggling to stand up like somebody who hasn't really learned how to stand in this skin. Yeah. And then you see him flat out supine with his head back outside the shop where he's going to sell the the wedding ring in order to get the money of which he has a he has a whole number and he's walking around he looks really awkward he looks really gangly he looks like he doesn't belong in that skin or in those clothes or on that planet during the course of the movie the way in which he moves changes and he sort of learns the mannerisms of humanity and that's why the very end shot again you know attempting to avoid plot spoilers but the very end shot yep. is of him going ah and then he looks down, he turns down, he turns the cap of his, you know, the top of his hat down. It's a very kind of human gesture. So it's almost like he's been completely consumed by life on Earth, yeah. um, you know, as opposed to life on Mars. And it's a physical performance. Now, obviously, so much of what Bowie was doing, particularly on stage, um, particularly with, you know, his relationship with Lindsay Kemp, uh, was to do with, with mime. Now, some of the Bowie miming, is a bit naff, you know, some of the, he's on stage and he's, you know, walking a glass wall and, you know, pulling himself up and he's like, I can take or leave that stuff. But he had done all that training 
And when you see him as a performer on stage, so much of what he's doing is to do with the physicality of it. It's not just the Ziggy Stardust stuff. It's when he's doing the Thin White Duke stuff. He's very conscious of the shapes that he throws. He's very conscious of the way in which his body moves. There's a lot of lovely bits of him dancing in Moon Age Daydream. Well, I think that what's happening when you see him in Man Who Fell to Earth, even if you didn't know it was Bowie a pop star or Bowie, yeah. you know, kind of super, whatever. What you'd get is a sense that that is somebody who does not look like they belong on earth. Yeah. And it's not to do with the fact that his hair is a funny color and he's got a wonky eye and, you know, it's to do with the way he moves. He looks like he's, like he's not used to the gravity. Well, that's performance. That's really clever, well registered performance. And I think Rogue allowed him to do that, which is a great credit to him as a director because he allowed Bowie to do the physicality to make that character sing in that way rather than because it all I mean the dialogue you've seen the film you know the dialogue at the beginning is very stilted he he sounds like he's speaking a foreign language which of course he is quite literally can I help yes I hope so I want to sell that Uh, where'd you get this ring it's mine my wife gave it to me I think one of the first moments in which he talks normally is that conversation in which he tries to explain where he's from. You know, he's sitting outside the hut and he sort of points up and he goes, well, it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's up there. Yeah. And that's really one of the first moments when he starts to look like he's behaving as a human being. Why'd you come here? Where I come from, there's a terrible drought. We saw pictures of your planet on television. We saw the water. In fact, our word for your planet means planet of water. You watched it all on television? Where exactly do you come from? Well, I'm not an astronomer, but... Somewhere down there. In the novel, there's a lot more... St- Have you read the novel, Simon? I haven't read the novel, no. Okay, you should do. It's a page-turner. It's very short. It's very, very easy to read. I mean, Walter Tevis was always annoyed because people said things like, oh, it was a failure of a novel that was made into a brilliant film. It was not a failure of a novel. <laughs> it was. It received some uh, serious critical attention. It won some serious prizes. Walter Tevis has you know, had a, actually an extraordinary record in terms of having his stuff filmed. It's a much better novel than people... It became fashionable to say, yeah. ooh, you know, Rogue took a you know a trashy novel and turned it into a work of genius. He didn't. He took a very, very good novel and turned it into a very, very good film. But in the novel, there is more overt discussion about what the effect of alcohol is on the alien. He talks about not knowing whether alcohol would have an effect on him and then starting to like it and starting to like what it does. And it's more overt. It's much more upfront. Something I don't see talked about an awful lot with Nicholas Rogue, and I found it particularly with this and with Don't Look Now, is how adept a storyteller he is. Yeah. Because when I was first introduced to The Man Who Fell to Earth, I get introduced to it off the back of its style, and that's what people tell me about and Bowie's extraordinary performance. But actually, there's a lot of story told in that film, and it ju- I didn't realise how much, really, until I was a couple of hours away from it. I think that's a skill and a half. The thing that he's very good at, which you're sort of alluding to here... He's very good at ellipsis. He's very good at elliptical storytelling. Yeah. What Rogue doesn't do is have people sit down and explain the plot to you. What he does is he puts things together that you kind of make sense of. One example of that would be around about the period in the film when it looks like he is going to go into the rocket and go back into space and he's in the limousine, you know? Yeah. And then suddenly he isn't going into the rocket, he isn't going into space, and the next thing is he's playing table tennis in that weird hotel. The where Jim he's... Lovell bit, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There is something really fast, because when you look at the way that part of the story is told, it's very disorientating. It's very, what? It's like, what? Yes. what's going on? Yeah. I thought he was going home. And what's great about it is it kind of reflects the confusion of what's happening. You know, it's like the the story becomes confused. Some people talk about The Man Who Fell to Earth unravelling, that the film falls apart, that it starts with a very straightforward premise. This is what he's got to do. He's got these things. He's got these patents that he can make the money out of. He can, you know, blah, blah, blah. He can do all that. Yeah, yeah. 
And then they say, and then about halfway through, it suddenly gets weird. And then the next thing is he's on the bed naked and he's got the gun and he's pulling his eyes out and he's got the thing. And then there's, you know, what happens is that the method of the storytelling reflects the state of mind of the central character. Yeah. The same can be said of Don't Look Now. The method of the storytelling reflects the way in which the central character, and actually in the case of Don't Look Now, the central character really is Donald Sutherland's character how he experiences the world. I mean, the opening sequence when he's looking at the still and the blood red splash happens on the still and he looks and he rushes out into the thing and he plunges into the water and he comes out of the water like a kind of Leviathan slow motion, those deep strings of Pino Donaggio's fantastic score. Yeah. That whole section is so expressionist in as much as what it's doing is capturing his experience of the world and then the car leaving for the funeral in this torrential rain not just rain but like absolutely biblical rain Mm. and then venice in which of course it's you know canals everywhere and we see what he sees we see christine reflected in the canal you've got that incredible Donaggio score, you know, you know, and it's just everything is pulsing in the way that he's experiencing the world. Also worth saying on the subject of the music that Bowie was originally going to score um, The Man Who Fell to Earth and the, the reasons... I was just about to ask you that. Yeah, the, well, the reason why he didn't is kind of, is, is steeped in confusion. He did start recording music for it. Exactly what happened to the sessions, you know, some exist, some are lost. There's a lot of ooga booga about it. Nick Rogue said that it came down to money, that uh, the film company, you know, stiffed him on the money and they, they weren't willing to pay for what they needed to get it done. No one's quite sure. What we do know is that Rogue told me that sometime after Low came out, Bowie sent him a copy of the vinyl album and said, listen to side two of this. This is what I would have done for The Man Who Fell to Earth. And there is at least one piece of music on low that began life as a piece that Bowie was writing as the score for The Man Who Fell to Earth. So there's this kind of lovely, slightly apocryphal, but, you know, it's a nice idea anyway, that if you play the second side of low over The Man Who Fell to Earth, it's the, it's the soundtrack album. Before we leave the subject of the man who who fell to earth, uh, I've got a quiz question for you. Mm-hmm. I know you love quizzes, Mark. I hate quizzes. I hate quizzes because because if you ever do a quiz, if you ask me what my name is, I won't even remember. So go ahead and torture me with my least, least favourite thing in the world. Excellent. Uh, that's what I'm here for. That's my gift. The man who fell to earth, what does it have in common with Paul W.S. Anderson's 1990s film Shopping? I'm going to give you the answer to this one. No, no, hang on. Let me think about this. <laughs> so it's not it's not a distribution thing because that's... It's sort British. of a distribution thing. You've landed fairly close already. Okay. Are British lions somehow sumped into whatever becomes... It's to do with the rank gong. Oh, rank took the gong off both of those. Is that right? Abs- Mark, see, you say you're terrible at quizzes. Right, right, right. You've absolutely smashed that. You get okay. the star prize, which is a Love Actually memento <laughs> signed you. by Richard Curtis, which thoughtfully we've already put in your office. Thank you very much. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Rank did withdraw the gong from it, didn't wow. they? Well, no, I didn't know. I was just figuring it out. I mean, I was just, I was just yep. thinking out loud because I remember there's another... I mean, Rank would do this every now and then that they would withdraw the yes. gong. <laughs> it was almost like the mark of quality was Rank have taken yep. their gong off it. <laughs> Paul W.S. Anderson is very happy that you've said that, <laughs> I would imagine. And so, Mark, before we let you go, what we like to ask guests on this podcast to do is to dig through the Studio Canal catalogue and come up with a dream double bill for us. And you've gone musical. We're back in the 1970s. You've picked for us That'll Be The Day and Stardust. So can you tell me why those two particular films should go before our eyes and ears? Well, I mean, again, this is kind of personal because, you know, I love pop movies. I've got a huge fondness for pop movies. And um, when I was a kid, I used to you know I used to go to the cinema and I used to listen to pop records that was it and every now and then those two things would collide I mean obviously this this relates back to Nick Rogue as well because obviously performance is one of those things that fits into the great pantheon of rock movies although it's technically not but it absolutely is and so when I was a kid the kind of things that you'd see in the cinema 
would be things like Never Too Young to Rock, which was this ridiculous British science fiction film in which pop music has been outlawed. And so all your favourite pop bands have to perform in this kind of underground circumstance. So it's got the Rubettes performing on the back of a truck and it's got Mud performing in a roadside cafe in the middle of a food fight. I mean, it's so British. It's just, (laughs) it's like brilliantly crap. And then there's another film called Take Me High in which Cliff Richard is on a barge and he invents a thing called the Brum Burger, which is a Birmingham hamburger. This is relevant to my interests. A Birmingham hamburger invented by Cliff Richard. Have you never seen Take Me High? No, nor have I had one of Cliff Richard's hamburgers. Yeah, well, you should see Take Me High. It's a, it's a, it's a, a really unusual collision of Cliff Richard barges and burgers. <laughs> and so that's a thing. That's the Venn diagram I didn't expect. But no. Okay. <laughs> and there's there's an Australian movie called Side by Side in which Shuadi Wadi and the Rubettes live next door to each other. I mean, it's a, this whole collection of like really, really sort of, you know, crap pop films then in the middle of it all you have this weird double bill which is that'll be the day in stardust which is sort of the story of somebody's journey to pop fame and it's very much in the tradition of movies like slade in flame yeah which of course is the you know is the citizen kane of of great british pop movies and the first part of the movie is kind of the the lead up to you know, I'm going to become a pop star. And the second part, which is Stardust, is I am a pop star and now I've gone mad and now I've retreated into a castle and, you know, and I'm only wearing white and, and I've gone bonkers. Ah, look what they've done to the rock and roll crowd. Ah, rock and roll clown, look his dad on the ground. Ah, what I love about the, the, the films is that they... I mean, for a start, in the case of That'll Be The Day, that came out in the early 70s, but it's got all this kind of 50s teddy boy vibe thing going on, which, of course, I was always very fascinated by. And it's got lots of cameos from, you know, pop stars that you will know and love. But it's also got this kind of sincerity to it, which is that in the same way as Ken Russell's Tommy, there's a British holiday camp pop aesthetic that really shouldn't work and probably doesn't work outside of the UK, but absolutely does because there's something about Britishness and pop in that period, yeah. which is that it's fantastically exciting, but also a bit rubbish. And I don't mean it's a rubbish film. I mean, what it does is it captures the slightly, and that's what I love about Slade in Flame. You know, it, it's it's the story of Don Powell's character, you know, but stuck at home having a cup of tea with his mum and Noddy Holder in his pigeon loft. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and Jim Lee and his wife worrying about whether the kitchen table will fit. And then it just also happens to be about they go to London, and they make a pop record, and they all fall out with each other. So it's a very, very British feel. And I mean, I think that'll be the day is a better film than Stardust. Yeah. I think Stardust kind of, Stardust sort of falls apart in its third act, but in a way it doesn't matter because as a double bill, they're great. And of course I, you know, it was double A and uh, it was, you had to be 14 when it came out and everybody wanted to see it because it had David Essex and... Very edgy David Essex as well in those films. Very edgy. Yeah. Well, yeah, but David Essex was always a bit, you know, he he had a bit of side to him. Yeah. Um. I mean, later on, it became you know the lovable rogue thing. But he, you know, he had that theatrical thing going on. He was, you know, he was he was an actor, pop star. And I remember seeing that'll be the day when I was too young to see it, and doing the thing about you'd stack your heels, you know, you'd put newspaper in your shoes so that you looked a little bit taller, <laughs> so that you looked like you were fourteen. I mean, that was just that was how you did it. And my sister had gone to sit; she was older than me, and she was fine. She got in no trouble, but she was a good two inches taller than me. So I remember going to see it at the Classic in Hendon and having to stack my heels in order to do it. I mean, it's, it's, so and then it was. It was just very, very iconic and of its time. And those two films together were kind of... Those two and Slade in Flame between them. I mean, if you're going to do it as a triple bill, um, I'd put Slade in Flame there. But as a double bill, Stardust and That'll Be The Day, it's one continuous story and it's, it's, it's just... It's just very, very of its time. And it reminds me of being a teenager. Do they have Brumbergers in, though? No. Oh, That's well, only out. take That's me it. high. That's it. I'm out. It's a great double bill, Mark, but no Brumbergers, no deal. It's a fairly strict rule we've got here. And the other thing <laughs> is, I always wondered whether whether Cliff Richard understood that take me high 
sounds like you know, like a drug road. I always wondered what the meeting was like when somebody explained to Cliff Richard the subject <laughs> of, of his next film. You know, We'll get him on the next well, episode Cliff, of the podcast. <laughs> you're on a barge. You know, like you were on a bus. Yeah, well, it's like that, but it's a barge. And rather than going to sunnier climbs, you're going to invent a hamburger. Remake it with Gerard Butler and call it Barge. You see, I'd, I would pay to see that. I would pay to see that. Yeah, we'd all pay to see that. Mark Kermode, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. You'll find The Man Who Fell to Earth on the Studio Canal Presents channel on Apple TV and Prime Video. It's also out now as a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray steelbook. Don't Look Now is available on the Studio Canal Presents channel as well as on Blu-ray and 4K disc. And if you fancy joining Mark for that David Essex double bill, That'll Be The Day and Stardust, they're both on, well guess where? The Studio Canal Presents channel as well as on Blu-ray disc. We've just got time for some news of what's been happening in the world of Studio Canal. The big screen first. April the 21st sees the return of the Evil Dead franchise with Evil Dead Rise. Directed by Lee Cronin, who previously made the acclaimed horror The Hole in the Ground, the new film relocates the terror from the woods to the big city. What's up, sis? I had the most beautiful dream. It was the perfect day. And all I could think about was how much I wanted to cut you all open and then climb inside your bodies <laughs> so that we could stay one happy family. <laughs> Series creator Sam Raimi co-writes and produces, and we're going to be talking all things Evil Dead in the next episode of this podcast. Mum? Mummy's with the maggots now. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the safety of your own home, you're soon going to be able to enjoy the 4K disc debuts of a pair of 1970s favourites, the Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers. Famously shot back to back, with the actors reportedly not realising they were making two films. These particular romps star Oliver Reed, Raquel Welsh and Richard Chamberlain. Directed by Richard Lester, they land on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray on the Vintage Classics label on April the 24th. That's it for this episode of Studio Canal Presents. We'll be back next month for another dive into the Studio Canal catalogue as we delve into the world of the evil dead. In the meantime, to find out more about Studio Canal films and the Apple TV and Prime Video channel, you can visit www.studiocanal.co.uk or follow Studio Canal at Studio Canal UK on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. And if you'd like to catch up on previous episodes on everything from Terminator 2 and The Driver through to The Railway Children and Apocalypse Now, you can find them all wherever you get your podcasts. Now, though, I'm off to get some tight-fitting clothes for a walk through the New Mexico desert. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Studio Canal Presents. Ta-ta for now. Studio Canal Presents.